to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. How many of you followed my instructions during the introduction? You, you uh, took out a sheet of paper, your bulletin, and you answered that question. What are you worrying about right now the most? If you, if you got that, pull it out again and just look at it one more time. Look at it and think about it. What are you concerned over? What's worrying you right now? Everyone I talk to is worried, filled with anxiety and stress. It is literally at epidemic, pandemic proportions in our culture and in our world. Would you agree with me? People seem burdened. People seem riddled by fear, by worry, and by anxiety. And we see folks having this, and they're responding to it in different ways. What are some of the ways that folks respond to it? Uh, worry and anxiety. Well, some will respond to it by ways of escape, escaping that reality, ignoring that worry and that fear. Folks will turn... Uh, to, to drugs. Folks will turn to alcohol. Folks will turn to unhealthy relationships. I've seen folks even uh, look to material things, the buying of stuff, just to, to get a buzz, to get a high, to get your mind off that worry, to try and ignore the reality. I want you to know that there is, a, is an alternative to this, our faith. Our relationship with the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ helps us to deal with worry, helps us to deal with anxiety, helps us to deal with stress. Understand with me that our relationship with Jesus is meant to touch us in the here and now, not just the hereafter. That's where uh, many of us would get hung up with that. We think, well, I I've trusted in the Lord Jesus. He's justified me before God, so now I have eternal life. And then we end it there. We forget that Christ has come. Christ has died to give us abundant life starting now, starting with conversion. And He doesn't want us to live in bondage. He doesn't want us to live eaten up, riddled, consumed by worry, anxiety, and fear. This morning, I want to share with you three things about dealing with worry. The title of the sermon, as I've shared, is Worry the Acceptable Sin. Are you doing that in your life? Are you just bowing down to worry? Have you just accepted it? it it's just going to be here, Brother Randy. I've accepted it. I'm going to be worried. I'm going to be anxious. I'm going to be consumed by it. It's going to be a tyrant in my life and govern me. Have you reached that point? Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, don't tolerate it. It's not the acceptable sin. Christ died to give us freedom from the bondage of sin, including the bondage of worry. Are you there in Matthew 6 now? Well, before we turn our thoughts to it again, I, I want to share with you just a few things, a few general things about worry and about this passage itself before we dive in and we see three things about worry. Just some general things. First of all, I want you to note with me in verses 25 uh, to 34 the specific type of worry that Jesus indicates. In verse 25, he says, I tell you, do not be anxious. In verse 31, he says, uh, do not be anxious. Then in verse 34, he says, do not be anxious. What type of anxiety is he talking about? What type of, uh, uh, of stress and Worry is he prohibiting for his disciples. Now, let me make that clear with you. The type of worry, the uh, type of stress that he is condemning and the type that he's not condemning. There is a difference between ungodly worry and healthy concern. Y'all understand that with me? There is a difference between ungodly worry and healthy concern. Jesus is not condemning, he's not prohibiting a healthy concern about things. What he's condemning, what he's prohibiting is ungodly worry. Well, what's the difference? Well, I'll give you just a little example. Here's, here's a godly concern. Here's having a healthy godly concern. Let's say that we knew that there was a lion outside those doors. A ravenous lion, a man-eating lion, hadn't eaten for weeks, and we knew that when the service was over, we had to walk right past him. Would you be a little, little concerned 
about that? Yeah, right? Would be legitimate, correct? That's, that's, I know that's a simple illustration, but that's a healthy concern. Something that's real. Something that's legitimate that concerns you to some degree. It doesn't dominate your life. You're not held hostage to it. It's real. It's legitimate. It's on your mind to some degree. That's a healthy concern. Now, ungodly fear would be different. Ungodly fear would be, let's say that you thought that this chandelier was about to fall. It's not, by the way. It looks, it looks good. But let's say that you were worried that the chandelier was going to fall on you during the service. Is that really rational? I mean, it looks good. Everything's in place. We don't hear any creaking, right? No creaking. What's the likelihood of that happening? It's low. But what if you sat here the entire time, and that's all you could think about? That thing is going to fall on me. While Brother Randy is preaching, one of those quiet moments, it's going to come crashing down, and it's going to fall on me. On top of that, I hadn't met my deductible for my health insurance. It's going to cost a lot when it falls in on me. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, doesn't it? That's ungodly worry. That's the type of worry and anxiety that Jesus is dealing with here. It's irrational, it's not legitimate, and it just permeates our lives. It consumes us to the point that we can't enjoy the blessings of God, to the point where we can't be there for the folks that we love in our lives emotionally and mentally. It's just dominating us. That's the type of worry that Jesus is engaging here. The second thing that I want you to see, and it's this, oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes, um, this ungodly worry is caused by ungodly priorities. This ungodly, uh, consumptive worry is caused by ungodly priorities. Look at verse 25 of our passage. It begins with the word, therefore. Have you ever heard the saying, when you see a therefore, you need to know why it's therefore? Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> therefore is like a rearview mirror. It's showing you, it's causing you to look behind you. Therefore is a rear view mirror. When you see therefore, what the writer is doing is drawing a conclusion based on what was stated previously. Everybody got that? Okay. So what Jesus is saying, he's drawing a conclusion based on what he just said in verses 19 to 21. He said, here's the conclusion that I want you to make. Do not be anxious. Well, what did he talk about in verses 19 and 21? He used three metaphors talking about the two decisions that we have in life. He uses uh, the metaphor of heavenly and earthly treasure, the metaphor of a healthy, sound eye and an unsound eye, and the metaphor of either serving God or mammon. You remember how we talked about that over the last three Sundays? And we said the idea that Jesus is saying is you can either live for Him you can let Christ set the priorities of your life. You can live for His glory or you can live for the goods and the ways of this world. What Jesus is wanting us to see is if we live like that, if we live for His glory, if we're not consumed by the cares and the things of this world, the result is we don't have to be anxious. But when we're caught up in the world, when we allow the world to dictate our priorities rather than the promises of God, rather than living for His glory, then we get eaten up with this ungodly, needless worry. A third thing that I want you to see. Unbelief can often cause this type of ungodly worry. Now, notice that I'm using the word often. I'm not saying every time. I'm saying many times, often. What do I mean by that? Well, here's where you and I often struggle. At least I do. I find it relatively easy to say and to trust the Lord to save my sins. Do you? To say, I can lean on Christ, His perfect righteousness in that He kept the law, 
His perfect righteousness there, Him giving of His life on the cross, leaning on that to save me, I find that relatively easy. And yet, the thing that I struggle with is small compared to that. I say, I can, I can trust Christ to meet my spiritual need. I can trust Christ to save me. But when it comes to making ends meet, paying bills, dealing with health, changing relationships in my life, that's the things that I struggle to trust the Lord with. Are you that way? No? Good. <laughs> Come up here and preach then. <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. But, <laughs> but no unbelief, not trusting the Lord here and now is often the source of our worries. And we're going to talk about this later on in the text. How do you stimulate your trust in the Lord? I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it needs to be said again. The way that we stimulate daily faith with the Lord is by saturating our lives in His Word. Praying, studying, memorizing the Word. It stimulates our belief, our trust in Him, and it helps us not to be consumed by that worry. Now, one more thing, and then we're actually going to get into preaching. Notice the natural division of the text again, because this is how we're going to break it down in the sermon. The text is broken down to three parts based on Jesus saying, do not be anxious. He says it in verse 25, and then from verses 25 to 30, he illustrates it. He elaborates on that. That's the first section. The second Division is verses 31 to 33. Verse 31, he says, don't be anxious again. And then he illustrates it. He gives more detail about it. And then in verse 34, our last part of the text, he says, therefore, do not be anxious. There's another prohibition, and then he explains it. There's three sections to this text about worry. That's how we're going to follow it this morning. Now, let me pray for us, and then we're going to dive in. Our Father, we come into your presence this morning, and Lord, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I know just based on the size, based on the number of the folks who are here, there are brothers and sisters that are worried about things. Lord, some of them have a healthy concern over stuff. It's legitimate. It's not dominating their lives. But others, they've got an unhealthy concern. It's consuming their lives. It is draining them mentally and emotionally, and it's hurting them, Lord, in their relationships. They're, they're physically present with their family and their friends, but their mind, their thoughts are just consumed and dictated and held hostage to worry. Oh, Father, I pray that you would take the truth of your word, apply it by the Holy Spirit, and break the bondage of worry in their lives. Lord, what we don't want to see happen is when we stand before you, be shown all the time that we wasted, all the opportunities that we missed, blessings that we missed, opportunities that we missed to share Christ and testify of Him, all because we were eaten up by worry and wouldn't yield to you, wouldn't trust you. Father, use this word to change that. We don't want those regrets at the end. Lord, free us from the bondage, the captivity of worry. Father, as I proclaim your word, Lord, I want to do justice to this text. I don't want to make it more complicated than it is. I don't want to stand in front of the words of Christ. I just want to put them out there. Help me, Lord, to do that. Use this message for your glory. Use this message for the edification, the building up of your people. Hear me now. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're dealing with this text in three parts. And we're just going to kind of answer this question. How do we need to deal with worry? I shared in our little introduction some of the ways that the world is dealing with worry today. Well, how do we as Christians need to deal with worry. Well, Jesus is encouraging us, exhorting us to remember three things. Three things, okay? Three things. They're all C's. Character, connection, and conclusion. Character, connection, and conclusion. All right, let's dive in. Point number one. The first thing that the Lord Jesus is wanting us to remember is the Father's character. 
One of the ways that he's wanting to release us from this bondage of ungodly, unhealthy worry and anxiety is to remember the character, remember the nature of our Heavenly Father. Now notice with me the text and what Jesus does. In verse 25, he gives this prohibition about anxiety, and he, he, he gives three things, uh, three things that we worry about. I've heard it called the unholy trinity of worries. Listen to what he says. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not your life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now understand with me, Jesus lived in a third world country. Do you understand that? Um, Israel, Galilee, was a backwater of the Roman Empire. They were an agrarian society, and they practiced so was it sustenance farming. They farmed not to sell the crops, but to eat the crops. They were very poor. It was a poverty-stricken land, and a few things could just ruin their lives and the lives of their family. If they didn't have enough rain, there'd be famine, they'd die. If they had too much rain, the crops would be ruined, they'd die. If there was fire, if there was wind, they were always living hand-to-mouth, so to speak, and they could be dominated by these worries. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to put on? Folks, you and I are blessed. We live in a first world country. We tend to not worry about things like that as much as other societies do. Sometimes we think that we're poverty stricken because we can't eat out every night of the week. When other societies are saying what? I don't have enough to eat. I'm starving. Well, what's Jesus getting at here when he mentions these three things? He mentions about an all-consuming worry over the daily necessities of life. He's saying, don't be, don't be worried about these things. Don't be consumed by the necessities of life. And then in verses 26 to 30, he gives three illustrations of this point that he's making. Remember, verse 25 is a prohibition. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about the necessities of life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on. And then in verses 26 to 30, he gives these three illustrations. We're going to walk through them quickly. But I want you to see that all these illustrations come together to form a unified point, and it's this. You and I should not worry due to the character and nature of our God. Folks, we believe, according to Scripture, that God is our Creator. He is good. He is just. He is holy. That means that He provides for that which He has created. He's not an evil creator. He's a good creator. He's not an evil father. He's a good father. So He takes care of His creation. Jesus gives three illustrations to prove that. The first one is in verse 26, and it's that of the birds. Listen to it. Look at the birds of the air. They neither, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, more, uh, not of more value than they? Remember where Jesus is. This is called the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is where? Yeah, he's in the mountains. He ain't in the delta. He's in the mountains. So he's out in the wilderness. More likely than not, there's probably birds, right? Aren't there birds in the mountains? Yeah. They could see birds. They could hear birds. Jesus is a great communicator. He's using an example that his hearers could pick up on and lock on to immediately. And he's using a, a, a type of Hebrew speaking. It's called, a, it's a comparison. And he's making an argument from least to greatest. Least to greatest. So he said, y'all see and hear these birds as I speak? They neither toil nor reap. Yet the heavenly Father takes care of them. Aren't you of more value than birds? What's he saying here? He's arguing least to greatest. As we think about what God has created, all of creation is important. All of it is good, as God has said. But we think about birds as kind of the smaller part of God's creation, right? Men and women are different, though. I don't care what Peter says. Men and women are different. We're made in the image of God. We are the climax, 
the pinnacle of God's creation. God takes pretty good care of the birds, doesn't he? If he takes care of the smallest portion of his creation, will he not take care of the climax, the pinnacle of creation? Will he not take care of men and women fashioned in his image? He will. Knowing him like that eliminates our worry and builds trust. God provides for his creation. Another illustration that he uses in verse 27 I call it the ruler or measurement illustration. He says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? What he's basically saying here is God is sovereign. He's creator. He gives life. And so he also determines when our life is over. He said, If you're sitting around and you're worrying about these things, can you add anything to your life? No. In fact, you can do the opposite. You can shorten your life by worry. By anxiety. It says God is in control. God is sovereign. Our days are numbered by the Lord. He gives life and He ordains when we go home to Him. Then the third illustration that He uses in verses 28 to 30, and again He's in the mountains, and He's using something that they would see. He's using the idea of the wildflowers, if you will. Listen to verses 28 to 30. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Let me stop right there before I read on. Solomon and his reign was considered a golden age in the nation of Israel. Solomon was just a byword for glory, for splendor. And he says, do you see the, the lilies of the field, the wildflowers? God clothes them better than Solomon. And you may be thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, a flower doesn't look like much, does it? But if you put it under a microscope, it's very intricate, isn't it? And very beautiful. That little bitty flower, God clothes with more splendor, more glory than King Solomon. And again, in verse 30, he makes this argument from least to greatest. He says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Again, he's making that similar argument to verse 26. If God takes such good care of one of the smallest parts of his creation, a flower, if he takes such good care, provides so well for them, Will he not take care of the pinnacle of his creation? Men and women who are made in his image, will he not take care of you? He will. What Jesus is calling upon us to do is to remember the character. (coughs) Remember the heart of our heavenly Father. Do you believe that God is good? Scripture says that. Do you know that God is good based upon experience? Has God ever failed you? Has there ever been a time when God didn't provide for you and God let you down? God is faithful to us. The book of 2 Timothy says that He is faithful in chapter 2 when we are faithless. God is faithful. One of the ways that we deal with our worry, this unhealthy, ungodly worry and anxiety, is to remember the character of our Heavenly Father. He's not an evil creator. He's a good creator. That which He has made, which He's fashioned. And according to Psalm 139, you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. He doesn't allow us to come into being and then say, done with you. No. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 17, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work hitherto. God continues to take care of us, continues to provide, continues to watch over us. That's the first thing I want you to see, the Father's character. The second thing I want you to see is the disciples' connection. So Jesus starts off talking about the character of the Heavenly Father, His watch care, His provision over creation so that we would not worry but trust Him. Now He's getting a little bit more specific. He says, you are disciples. You know this Creator. You know Him intimately through me. Listen to verses 30 to 30, uh, 31 
to 33 again. He says, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, <coughs> What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Again, there's that uh, prohibition against that kind of worry. Then he explains it in verse 32. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verses 31 to 32, this part of the passage, it's verse 32 that helps us to interpret it. And there's two phrases in verse 32 that are so important for our purposes this morning. It's the word Gentiles and the phrase your heavenly Father. Do you see it there in your text, the word Gentiles? And then the phrase, your heavenly Father. What's he mean by Gentile? He's not talking so much about race or ethnicity as he is your standing with the Lord. He's using the word Gentile to refer to someone who does not know the Lord. Someone who is not converted. Someone who does not have an intimate relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. You got it? Okay, look at the next thing. That phrase there, your heavenly Father. He's doing a contrast here. He says the Gentiles, they don't know the Father. They're estranged from Him. They're alienated from Him by their sin. But you, on the other hand, because you are in me <coughs> and I am in the Father, you can call Him your heavenly Father. You are connected to your Creator intimately, lovingly. That didn't rock your world. What's wrong with you? What's he saying? This God who watches over his creation. This God who cares for every part of his universe. Every part of this world that he has created. He is your Father. He is your Father through Christ. Now just think about that word Father for a second. What, what's a Father? A father is, is a head of a family who provides for that family. If they're just getting it down to, to simplicity here. The head of a family that provides for his family. Can we agree on that? Head of a family that provides for his family, okay? What do we think of as a father? Somebody that does that. Somebody that carries that out. We live in a fallen world. It's tainted by sin, so sometimes daddies don't do that as they should. All of us do it imperfectly. But that idea of earthly father is to point us to the heavenly father who does it perfectly. What Jesus wants us to see is by being in him, we know God not as distant, not as judged, not as estranged from us, not as an enemy, but as our father. He is our leader. He takes care of us perfectly because we are his children. Because we're in right relation to the Father, we need not worry. Do you realize how liberating that is? I don't think you do. Wake up. Look at me. Listen. Come in close. You don't have to worry about the decisions of your life. When you were growing up, who made the decisions of your family? Daddy. You don't have to worry about provision. Being taken care of. When you were growing up, who took care of the family? Daddy did. That's what Jesus wants you to see. Because you're in Christ. You don't have to be consumed by worry. Consumed by fear. Consumed by an anxiety thinking, what am I going to do in this decision? How am I going to take care of this? This situation is too complex. I don't know what I'm going to do. You don't have to worry. Your heavenly Father has got it. Doesn't that make you feel good? Am I the only one? Am I preaching to me? How do we deal with worry? The Father's character. He watches over the least of His creation, so He'll watch over the pinnacle of His creation, men and women. How do we deal with worry? We remember our connection to Him. He's not distant. He's not far. He's close to us in Christ. We can depend on Him. We can trust Him. Because we know Him. Now lastly, I want you to see, this causes us to reach an appropriate conclusion. Look at verse 34. That's the last division of our text. There's another therefore. Did y'all see it? 
What do we say about therefore? Huh? It's a rear view mirror. You'll look back on what was just said to draw a conclusion. Jesus said, all right, based on what I just said, here's how you need to live. Don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What's he saying? Based on what I just told you, disciples, Christians, based on what I just said about the Father, His uh, character, your connection to Him, you don't have to be worried. You don't have to be overcome by this pervasive, all-consuming anxiety.